Praise the Lord, everybody. I'm Tony Brick Brown coming with our sit-ups today, our spiritual impact training using prayer and scripture. That's the acronym sit-ups, spiritual impact training using prayer and scripture. This is about getting the word and prayer. We do the morning prayer, 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Monday through Friday. Information is underneath the YouTube video, and then you come on here and you can get your word for today. Get your pen, get your paper, get your highlighter. And most of all, get your Bible so that you can take notes and go back and study after we get this word today. We are continuing our study in the book of Genesis. And so, listen, if you missed Genesis 1 through 8 and the first half of 9, go back and get those sessions. Go back and replay them, watch them, uh, and get all of this because every part of this word goes together. All the principles, you want to get them. All of this is going to come together and begin to... Um, Give us the whole picture. Like sometimes we go in and people pull a scripture from here and a scripture from there. But when you begin to read through books and chapters all together, you begin to see it all come together and gain more understanding of how the Old Testament, the New Testament come together. Who's who and why, you know, this happened and why that happened. And also you are able then to reference scriptures and connect them so that you know that the word of God does not contradict them, it contradict itself. But you can prove the word by going and connecting the word. And so we are in Genesis chapter 9. We're going to open up in prayer. Don't forget there's an e-booklet available if you need to get some motivation to uh, do the sit-ups, to stay in the word and stay in prayer and grow. Um, that link is underneath this YouTube video. And don't forget to share this video. Like it, share it, help other people to find it, other people to participate in the studies so that we as a body can grow together. No matter how many times you've read the Bible, the more you read it, the more principles you see, the more promises you see, the more understanding you gain, the more your faith is increased. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We are being perfected by the word, but we're also clothing ourselves in the armor and we are battle ready with our spiritual weapon, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we're going to open up in prayer. We are in Genesis chapter nine. We are on the last portion. I do believe we're going to try to finish it up today. And so father, in the name of Jesus, we come rejoicing and praising you and honoring you and glorifying you. We thank you for your word. That is truth. Your Holy spirit, who is our teacher. We thank you, Lord God, that you know, Father, each of us individually, and Father, we ask that you would pour into us at our point of need, our level of understanding, that we will be changed, that we will be on overflow, that your word will be like fire shut up in our bones, that you would uh, just purge us, that you would prune us, that you would cleanse us and purify our hearts, renew our minds, that we are being changed and conformed into the image of your son. And so God, have your way, and we thank you with all our getting, we get understanding. So thank you for the bread of life, the living water, and we give you all the honor, praise, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 9. And so um, we are going um, to begin in verse 18. This is where we left off. In our last session, we talked about the covenant, God's promise with the rainbow, never to wipe out the whole earth with the flood again. We talked about the rainbow. Is it pride? Or is it a promise? So we need to know what a rainbow truly stands for, that this is something that shows the glory of God, the promise of God, the covenant of God between he and the earth. And so now we are in verse 18 and it reads, it is written, and the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth and Ham is the father of Canaan. You want to remember that. Then in verse 19, it says, these are the three sons of Noah and of them was the whole earth overspread. Now remember that when Noah and his family and the animals came off of the ark, Noah and his sons were instructed to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish the earth, or to repopulate. So this verse 19 is letting us know we've all come from one of those three sons. So again, all the earth was wiped out, every living thing. So all mankind is coming from Shem or Ham or Japheth. Now, later on down the road in studies, we can go deeper into this, but I'll just give you an overview just so you have an idea that from Shem, the, the Hebrews, the Israelites came from Shem. Also the Chaldeans, the Assyrians, the Persians, and the Iranians. From Ham, right? The brother Ham, the Canaanites, the Egyptians, the Philistines, the Hittites, the Amorites. And then from Japheth comes the Greeks, the Thracians, and the Scythians. So 
the Hebrews, the children of Israel, they come from Shem. So you got Abraham, you got David, you got Jesus. And then from Ham, uh, the descendants settled in Canaan, Egypt, and the rest of Africa. And then Japheth, you have um, most of them settled like in Europe and Asia Minor. And so these are things that you can look in your study Bible and you can, but you need to remember that the Israelites came from Shem. You need to understand that Canaan, came from Ham. This is important as we go through the word of God because, um, well, let's go through here. In verse 20, it says, Noah began to be a husband man and he planted a vineyard. So now Noah, we need to get some understanding here with Noah as we look in verses 21 and 22 because, uh, or 20 and 21, because Noah began to be a husband, meaning he was cultivating the ground and he planted a vineyard. So now we have Noah who is um, starting to uh, farm, right? And so the Bible tells us in verse 21 that Noah drank of the wine and was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent. So now, this shows us something. Now, Noah, when we look back in chapter 6, Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord, or favor in the sight of the Lord. In the midst of a perverse nation, a world, a earth, there was evil. Um, God talked about that man's thoughts were evil continually. It grieved him at his heart. It, he repented that he had made man. He decided to destroy everybody. But Noah found grace in his sight. But this shows us here, because he's naked or drunken, um, and uncovered within his tent, we see that he was still not perfect. Got to keep my throat going today. I've been choking. Um, but the thing is, is that we need to realize we've never just made it. No matter how much we go to church, no matter how much of this, and no matter how many scriptures we memorize, this is a constant battle, flesh and spirit. We need to understand that no matter what we've overcome, no matter how much we're pressing into God, it's a constant battle. We can't get relaxed. We can't get lazy because we are not yet perfected. We are being perfected. And so we are growing, changing, and progressing, but we are not perfect. And so we need to understand this is a constant walk. This is a constant pressing into God, a constant seeking his word, a constant battle. And so we need to see that Noah wasn't perfect just because he found grace in the sight of the Lord. He was following God. He loved God, but he was still yet man. And because of the fall of man with Adam and Eve, we were all born into sin. So we're all fighting against the flesh. And so it says he drank of the wine, was drunken, he was uncovered and it's within his tent. Verse 22, and Ham, the father of Canaan. Notice how it keeps saying that. There is a reason for that. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of the servants, shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Now, what happened? Noah got drunk. The Bible tells us that he was uncovered in the tent. It tells us that Ham went in. He saw him, right? He saw the nakedness of his father and he went out and told his brothers. His brothers came in, took a garment, laid it on their shoulders and they backed in. They went in backwards, covered up the nakedness of their father with their faces backwards so they did, they did not see their father's nakedness. They didn't look upon his nakedness. So now when Noah comes out of his drunken stupor, it says he awoke from his wine and knew what the younger son, Ham, had done, he said, curse be Canaan. He said Canaan was going to be a servant to his brothers. Canaan was going to be a servant to those from Shem. Canaan was going to be a servant to, to Japheth. 
So now he's talking about descendants. He has put a curse on his grandson. Because remember, when it tells us in um, in verse 18, and then it tells us again in verse 22, that Ham is the father of Canaan. Ham is Noah's son. Canaan is, is um, Noah's grandson. And so now he has cursed his grandson. He didn't curse Ham. He cursed Canaan. Ham is the one that did whatever this terrible thing is. And let me tell you something. There is a big debate, you know, theologians, people debating about why Noah cursed Canaan and didn't curse Ham. And what was the big deal about him seeing his father's nakedness? What was it? Was it that he looked down on him and then he went out there and told his brothers and was mocking them? Also, uh, you know, there's just several different ways that people are going about saying, you know, what was so terrible that Noah would curse his grandson? Well, I want us to look in Leviticus chapter 18, um, because one of the things now, and I'm not saying what this is. I'm just telling you some of the things that is the big debate. My thing is always, if it ain't in the word, we don't know, right? But we do know whatever he did was considered something horrible, and Noah didn't curse Ham, he cursed Canaan. And then I'm going to show you what God does with that because God allowed it. And there's a purpose for it because God always has a plan and God knows what's to come and we do not. So now in Leviticus chapter 18, now remember that Leviticus is after the children of Israel, you know, have been delivered from bondage in Egypt. Remember that as we go through Genesis, we're going to find out by the time we get to Exodus that the children of Israel are now have been birthed, right? God's chosen people, and they're in bondage and slavery in Egypt, and they cry out to God. And after, um, you know, a time, God hears their cry, and God delivers them from slavery, and he is leading them to the promised land, right? And so when they, um, when we get in Leviticus, these these are laws and commands for the people of Israel, the Hebrews. And so now when we look in chapter 18, it tells us that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak unto the children of Israel, say to them, I am the Lord, your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein you dwell, shall you not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, you shall not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. Now, I'm bringing you here for a couple of reasons. For one, we need to understand that God delivered the children of Israel from Egypt, from bondage. But he's taking them to the promised land. He's leading them to the promised land. He's leading them for 40 years through the wilderness to get to the promised land. What is the promised land? The promised land is Canaan. Now, this is like hundreds of years this is now now let's let's get a timeline here let's realize something right now first of all when noah lived like this is thousands of years later because when noah was living when this happened right we have to understand that you know um uh he curses his grandson but there is not yet the children of israel they have not been birthed right? Abraham has not been born. And they came through Abraham's seed. But Abraham, you have to understand, lived, he was 75, didn't even have any children yet. He was 100 before Isaac was born. And then the, the children of Israel weren't birthed through Isaac, but through Isaac's son, Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons, and the children of Israel were birthed through there, and through, you know, his, his sons. And then um, you know, you got years going by before they were even in Egypt. And then when they were in Egypt, they were in slavery for over 400 years before God delivered them. So when we're looking at Noah and his grandson Canaan, we're looking way before there was even a Canaan. But when God made uh, uh, separated his people, the children of Israel, and then they were in bondage for over 400 years. And then they cried out to God and he delivered them from bondage. He tells them that he's going to take them to a land flowing with milk and honey. It's the promised land. It's Canaan. So what is significant here? One thing that's significant is that God had told them they were going to have to go to this promised land and drive out the inhabitants. Drive them out. Who are the inhabitants? The descendants of Ham. It's the Canaanites. They came from Canaan. 
And so the thing is, is that the ites that were there came from Canaan and they were wicked and they were evil. They opposed God. And so it justified the fact that the children of Israel, many hundreds of years after Canaan was born, right, and cursed, now the children of Israel go and there's their promised land and they're driving out the, the Canaanites and the ites that were with them. And now you're talking about what Noah said in this curse. He says that Canaan will serve Shem. Canaan will serve Japheth. So now the descendants of Canaan are going to be under, right? And so now the descendants of Shem, the descendants of Japheth are over Canaan. And Canaan and the people of the Canaanites and the ites connected are evil and wicked, doing wicked practices. And so now it justifies that the children of Israel don't go into a promised land and push out good people that are following God. No, they're pushing out and driving out those that oppose God, those that are following false gods, those that are doing wicked practices and evil works. And so now also look back at Leviticus 18. Now I went here to show you that God is telling the children of Israel after they leave Egypt, don't do what Egypt did, right? And don't you do what the people in Canaan are doing. Don't do that. Don't walk in their ordinances. Don't follow after their practices. Verse four in Leviticus 18 says, you shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord, your God. So he's saying, don't do what the Egyptians did to had you in bondage. Don't do what the people in Canaan are doing. You're going to go in there and drive them out. Don't follow their practices. In verse five, it says, you shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgment which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. He said, if you do what I say, you'll live in them. That's life to you. Obey me. But then we get to verses six and seven and eight and nine. Listen, verse six says, none of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of your mother shall you not uncover. She is your mother. Thou shall not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife shall thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, the daughter of your mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not un uh, uncover. And it goes on talking about this nakedness. Well, when you look at these same verses of scripture in the NLT, this is what it says in, beginning in verse 6. You must never have se sexual relations with a close relative for I am the Lord. Do not violate your father by having sexual relations with your mother. She's your mother. You must not have sexual relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with any of your father's wives, for this would violate your father. Do not have sexual relations with your sister or half-sister, whether she's your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she was born into your household or someone else's. So it goes on. And what this is saying is when it's talking about nakedness here, it's talking about sexual relations. So many of the people that are debating what Ham actually did with Noah, some are saying it wasn't just that he saw him uncovered, but that the nakedness means either he had some action with Noah or with Noah's wife their mother. And some even go as deep as to say that Noah had sexual relations with Noah's wife and Canaan was actually not just Ham's child, but uh, Noah's uh, wife's child, right? And so it would be his stepson and his grandson. Now, I don't, I'm just telling you how people are interpreting what Ham did. However, the Bible does not specifically say anything. It said basically that Ham saw his father uncovered and told his brothers and his brothers came backwards and didn't look at his father's nakedness and covered him up. And so whatever Ham did, whether it was sleep with his father, sleep with his mother, um, whether it was just that he looked down on the nakedness of his father, whatever he did, right? It was evil in Ham's in uh, Noah's sight. Noah cursed Canaan and God allowed it because God already knew that he was going to set apart 
right? Some children of Israel down later down the road and that they were going to be in bondage for over 400 years and he was going to deliver them and he was going to take them to this promised land and the promised land was going to be Canaan that came from Canaan and it was going to be wicked people there and that the children of Israel was going to drive them out. This is how God does things thousands of years ahead of time. We don't know what God is doing. Stop trying to figure God out and just follow God. Just do what God says because God knows what we don't know. He's everywhere at the same time, which doesn't just mean in different locations. He's in the past, the present, and the future. And so I just wanted to give you some background information. I like to connect verses with verses. We all have the Holy Spirit who is our teacher, but I'm not going to teach you something that's not in the Bible. So regardless of what I feel like this possibly means with Ham, I'm not going to teach that to you unless I have scripture to back it up. So I just took you to Leviticus to show you why some of the arguments are as they are. But at the end of the day, what really matters is that Noah cursed his grandson for what his son did. And then there is some repercussions down the road because of the people that are going to come from Canaan because he was already cursed. Because all God already knows how people are going to be and what's going to take place. So now, the Bible tells us, go back to Genesis, right? And in Genesis chapter 9, it tells us um, that then Noah not only curses Canaan, but now he speaks that Canaan is going to serve his brothers. So now we see that God has allowed this to take place and that this is going to continue to, this is why it's important to read all of the word, because this begins to give you more understanding of what's going on. When people say, oh yeah, the children of Israel were in bondage, God delivered them and took them to the promised land and the promised land was Canaan. Well, why did God let them go to Canaan and drive the people out? Well, now you know, because because the people there were wicked, they were evil because they came from Canaan and Canaan was already cursed. God allowed that because he already knew the hearts of the people. He already knew what was going to take place. But this is all the way back from Noah. Things don't just happen in the Bible, just like things don't just happen in real life. Um, now, it, it's things that happen, that transpire, that cause things to happen. When we see evil and wickedness now, we know that that didn't just pop up. It's something that is, is, is evolving because of wickedness and evil, birthing more evil and wickedness, birthing more evil and wickedness and pushing God out of everything and now we see that it is nothing for people just to go and just murder and to, you know, destroy people's lives and, and you know, and to um, you know, be in ungodly relationships and ignore God's instruction and live according to the ways of the world and follow after the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. We have to understand that things evolve and they happen and there's a core and there's a root. And so now we're out of time for today, but I want you to go back and meditate on this. I want you to go back and I want you to, um, to study this. I want you to, you know, you can see how the Holy Spirit reveals to you, but we need to understand some principles here. We need to know that everybody did come from Ham, Shem, and Japheth. We need to know that we are from one of them, but we also need to know that just because you did some good things, because you found favor with God at some point, doesn't mean that you're perfect. No, it was not right? Noah made mistakes also. And so the thing that we also need to understand is that there's consequences to sin. Whatever that sin is, Ham knew that he shouldn't have done what he did. And so now what he did, again, affected generations to come. We need to remember Adam and Eve, what they did still is affecting us and will always affect mankind. We need to understand that when we sin, it affects the next generations. It affects people around us directly or indirectly. So Ham's sin, whatever that was, affected not only his son, but all of the generations that came from Canaan. And so now, for thousands of years. And so the thing is, is that we need to understand what we do. It matters. Decisions that we make, they matter. So as we talk about fighting for family, those of you that are participating, sending a scripture and or a prayer out every single day for a minimum of 365 days to your loved one, to your unsafe family member, your backslidden loved one, that person you've been ministering to, we are fighting for family. And that means that not only can we just send them a scripture or a prayer, but we have to live upright and make decisions that will affect them in a manner that makes them hunger and thirst after righteousness. Want, they they want to know what must they do to be saved. They begin to desire what we have on the inside. If we can't live raggedy and reckless 
and worldly and then send a scripture out and then, you know, believe that, you know, our family members don't want Jesus. We have to live a life before them that is light, a life that is righteous, walking in the word of God, in the faith, um, walking uh, in love, walking in obedience. We have to walk a walk that causes people around us to hunger and thirst after righteousness and desire what it is that God offers. And so now, um, the memory verse for today, um, the memory verse for today, hmm, let's just do um, verses 25 through 27, because we want to remember this about Canaan, um, the curse Remember, it's Noah's grandson and remember why it's done. Because as we go further down in Genesis and then Exodus and the books after that, um, as we are going through or however, whatever order God has us to go in, I don't know if it's always going to be in order like that, but we will need to remember what is going on with the Canaanites and all the ites. And so we're going to close out in prayer. So verses 25 through 27, meditate on that, but meditate on all of chapter nine and get some recaps because when we come back, we're going to be going into chapter 10. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we rejoice in you and honor you. We praise you. We thank you, God, for your word. Help us to walk upright before you, Lord God, to be holy because you're holy. Help us to turn away from even the appearance of evil, to abstain from even the appearance of evil, according to your word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray with all our getting that we get understanding that you help us, Lord God, Father, to study your truth, your word, Lord God, and that we hide it in our heart, that we are being changed from the inside out. And so, Lord, have your way in us and through us. We pray for somebody to be saved today, delivered today through the word that somebody will be healed today delivered from bondage today that their eyes will be open like scales falling from their eyes and so god we thank you for transformation salvation cleansing purity holiness and repentance lord god father coming upon men women and children and we give you all the praise glory and honor in jesus name amen god bless you love you to life and i will see you on our next session of our sit-ups